Hey everyone, as we wrap up Back to Basics Month, we're going to do a throwback to episode 56 when we got to tour the Brown Foreman Cooperage and talk about the barrel building process. This seems like a good fit to put us across the finish line. Next week, we're going to be back with a brand new episode. Don't forget to buy your tickets to the Kentucky Derby Museum's Legend Series taking place on April 20th, featuring the president of Old Forester, Campbell Brown. Tickets are $75 per person, or $65 if you're a museum member, and they can be purchased online at derbymuseum.org. We're very happy to give away a few bottles of bourbon this month to our Patreon supporters. We always like to talk about Heaven Hill Bottle and Bond uh, you know, being a Kentucky-only release, and we talk about it all the time on the, on the community roundtables, but this gives some more people a chance to try it. And we're very happy to be able to give those away to the people that actually won this month. If you want to be a part of the drawing next month, make sure you support us on Patreon. We've got sponsorships just starting at $1 a month, and $5 a month gets you into the drawing. Visit patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash bourbon pursuit. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here today, and we are at another location. This is actually our very first for us. We're at a, our first Cooperage. Yeah, we've been one to come to one for so long, and like, and it was just so cool to see like what goes on. And like, we just went through the whole process, and I'm excited for our listeners. Kind of, you know, this the barrels where a lot of the magic happens. So I'm excited for the listeners. Kind of get to, you know some knowledge on what the process is on getting the the you know from wood to from the tree to the barrel you know to the finished product so i'm I'm excited about today's episode yeah i mean i think it's really cool just because the fact that um as you said i mean there is there's there's so much flavoring so many characteristics that go into bourbon that just comes from the barrel itself and you kind of forget about the process that even goes to that part because everybody is so fascinated with going to distilleries and they see the, you know, the whiskey being made, but they don't realize that like, that's going to taste like crap until <laughs> it really ages and matures. And, and what's going into these, I don't know if you would call it artisanal, but I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very uh, handmade product that goes into uh, making this sort of stuff. Yeah. And it's pretty cool. It puts things in perspective too. how, how much, the bourbon industry is like impacting our economy when like we rolled through there i'm, I'm not sure how many workers will ask michael but it's just so many you know workers and supplies and all these parts that just you know you need to have to keep this industry alive that it's, it really impacts our economy it's pretty cool yeah i mean we and today we are at the brown form and cooperage uh we'll talk a little bit more about it and what makes it unique and special but there was a release of cooper's craft that just happened recently and it was named uh, it's actually one of the first brands that are coming out of brown Foreman uh in in ages that isn't you know woodford or old, or Forrester, old yeah. Forrester uh or jack daniels or whatever right so it's it's one of their, their new uh labels and it's being named after the cooperage here so i think that's that's pretty exciting and we're going to get michael's take on that as well but there's also uh, kind of a, a little fun fact for any of those soccer fans that are out there that uh the number one team in usl right now is louisville city who just wrapped up their 15 game win streak and are getting ready to head to the playoffs but the local supporters of the hooligans whatever you want to call them uh they're actually called the louisville coopers <laughs> so cool. kind of all it all comes full circle here so with that that good segue and introduce our guest to today we have michael nelson michael is the plant director at the brown formage cooperage so michael welcome to the show welcome thanks guys thanks for having me yep so let's get a little bit more background about you so first were you just did you just come to brown foreman from a machinery background or do you have affinity with bourbon at all before you came here or is how, how'd that kind of start no so my background's in manufacturing uh, specifically construction materials but i've been around uh processes where you're, you're making something my whole life. You know, I've, my, my dad, my, my grandfather, they were in manufacturing type industries. And so I've been around it, hearing about it at the dinner table since I was a kid. And so it's, although making a barrel is, is something I hadn't done before I came to Brown Foreman, not too many people in the world right. are doing it anymore. Uh, but it was, it was, uh, you know, a, a pleasure to, to get to come here and learn, learn this process because it's so unique. And so it's, there's not nothing else out there that's like this place. Lots of Legos as kids. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess did you uh, did you have a affinity or a love affair with bourbon before you started here, or is it just kind of a, a byproduct of, of maybe working here or something like that? I, it's it's probably closer to a byproduct. I've always been drawn to uh, tradition and and heritage and and you know anything that's truly American has always kind of been a draw to me and the the culture that is around bourbon. Um, that that's you know inherent in Kentucky that's that's 
probably the, the, the thing that I brought with me here was that appreciation for, for the tradition of, of any, anything that's really American. And, and this place, I don't think you can find any, any place any more American and traditional than this yeah. cooperage. Um, it's, it's in the heart of Kentucky, which is in the heart of America, using American white oak with an American workforce, um, making, a, making a container and a barrel for, for American bourbon. I mean, it's, it's what's so cool about it. Yeah, coming off of Fourth of July, we're all just going to get American flag tattoos after that. <laughs> that comment wow. right there, right? Proud to be American. Yeah. <laughs> so, give us before we get into the technicalities of, of barrels and char and all that good stuff. Kind of talk about a little bit of the history of the grounds here. I mean, so how familiar are with the the building? How long has it been in existence? When was the first production? All that sort of stuff. Yeah, the cooperage has been around since the '40s, the mid '40s. Um, it started as a, uh, a furniture factory. And um, when Brown Foreman bought it after the uh, Second World War, they turned it into a new barrel cooperage, and that's what it's been doing and operating as ever since. Um, so the, the place has been around for a long time, decades, 70 years. We just celebrated our 70th anniversary this year, and it was an opportunity to show our appreciation for the employees, the men and women that are, that are in the cooperage making the barrels. Um, without them, you know, we, w- we wouldn't have what we have. Uh, you, you wouldn't have a lot of the great bourbons that we enjoy. And, and so it, it was an opportunity to honor um, our most senior employee, who's now got uh, 47 years in this place, and he's in better shape than I'll ever be and, and says that he's going to go to 50 years. Um, so, you know, we're, we're proud to have uh, Charlie working here. So, you know, we, we celebrated Charlie's tenure here, and also it was a chance to, to be able to recognize all of our employees that have had 30-plus years in this place, and we've got a number of them. And, and, you know, once people get in here, they don't leave. Right. Now, I guess one thing that we, we need to give our listeners, and we had the opportunity to go, and you gave us a, a private tour of the facility. And not a lot of people, maybe when they make it to Kentucky, they, they kind of forget to go check out a cooperage. But kind of give the, the, the cooperage 101, if you will, right? Kind of talk about some of the process that, that you showed us through, uh, but kind of, you know, in words this time instead of being able to see it visually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you've got a, first of all, bourbon has to be, um, stored in a new white oak con- charred white oak container. So we've got a few sawmills in our portfolio as Brown Foreman to where we quarter saw uh, the lumber that comes into our yard, which we then let season. Um, we let it season out in the open air, um, and then we introduce it. Any time frame that usually seasons? Yeah, we, we like to have it season at least six months. That's our, that's our preference. Um, it can season for specific products uh, years, literally. You know, we'll have, we've got some wood out in the yard that's been around five years just, just seasoning. And, you know, you, you may see, see a, an expression from, from one of our brands um, at some point with, with that wood. And so, but, but we like for it to season at least, at least six months and, and, you know, we'll get it age it longer than that if we can. So how do you, how do you keep something that's sitting outside for five years, like away from, uh, maybe elements or, uh, bugs or pests or anything yeah, like that? Bugs and pests don't, aren't, aren't really a, an issue. Um, we don't, you know, other than a wasp's nest here and there, you know, we're not, we're not dealing with Just carry around raid with you. Yeah. You know, anything that's going to have a, a negative effect on the wood and we want the elements to hit it we want it to be rained on we want the wind to, to to hit it we want the snow to hit it you know that's what we're we're seasoning it um and we want we want mother nature to do its thing and dry it for us as well you know it's cheapest way to to dry lumber is let let mother nature do it but it, it can only do so much so then we have to introduce it into our kilns and we dry it um to our moisture specifications and then it's ready to be introduced into the process so you, we kind of got an idea that we, we saw it go from, actually, we didn't get to see the yard because I'm sure it's massive, but it went from a yard to like an indoor drying area, right? And you said, I mean, it was pretty massive. It's like an airplane hanger, right? Yeah, so we store our wood in that, what we call dry storage. Um, we store the wood in there after it's dry. We, we don't want to let, let it get rained on once we've, we've dried it. So we'll introduce it into dry storage, and then it's ready for production. So how often are you going through this airplane hanger full of wood? How we, often we'll turn you? that over about once a week. And it's, uh, you get in there and there's, there's lots of white oak in there. You know, it's, it's a pretty, you can smell it. It's cool. You know, it's, a, it's, yeah, a, it's got impressive. A, it's got a nice in. smell to it. Um, and it's, it's uh, cool to see. Um, but relatively speaking, we don't consume a lot of wood relative to the, to the, to the market, to the industry, um, to the, the housing market drives wood consumption. So um, we still stay pretty tight to um, 
um, the forestry industry, because we have a vested interest, our entire industry has a vested in- interest in seeing that the white oak is around for ever. Um, it's a sustainable resource, and, and we intend to keep it that way and support um, the forestry industry uh, where we can as a company because it's critical to our business. Right. So after it goes from the drying area, did we see it go through like a planer or something like that, yep. where it's cutting edges or smoothing it or yeah, something so, like uh, that? Yeah, so we get the, the raw staves and heading pieces that have been cut at the mill we dry them and then we introduce them into the process which starts with planing the wood which puts smooth surfaces on the top and bottom and then we do what we call joining the wood and that's putting the edge on the sides of the board of the pieces of heading and staves so then the uh, staves can fit tightly together to make uh, to make a barrel because at the end of the day the the object of this game is to make a tight fitting barrel that holds a liquid that liquid being whiskey Right, because we saw we saw the the joining of the pieces come together, and then we saw it go over to another individual who's sitting there, and it's almost like a almost like a mathematical equation in his head, right? Trying to figure out exactly which uh, pieces yeah, of, he's of pulling out staves, sticking them in a hoop, trying trying to figure out which ones are going to fit. Yeah, correctly. So, you, so you're referring to the barrel razors. The barrel razors, after the wood's been planed and jointed and shaped properly, the barrel razor has to fit and select the the individual staves into the shape of a barrel, and he's or she is counting the number of staves that are going into that barrel and also selecting different width sizes as they go, doing all this in, you know, 40, 50 seconds on average. And they can do it a lot faster if, the, if they need to. But they're counting in their head. They're making sure the stave's not backwards. They're selecting different width sizes and making sure that barrel's going to be a nice tight fit. So how many staves are usually on average in a barrel? On average, there's about 31 staves in a barrel. And uh, the... Uh, Again, the barrel raisers are, are counting that in their head and making sure that, that whatever number we've we've got set up to put in a barrel, that they're they're hitting it right on. Is there, I mean, is there a reason why you would go like, you know, fat, skinny, skinny, fat, instead of just being like, we're just going to have all fat barrels or all, all skinny yeah, staves? Yeah, it's, it's, you're talking geometry at that point, and it's probably more technical than you guys care to well, know. Right. But yeah. It's angles, so right? It's, it is. It's, 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 cool. it's, yeah. You've got the, the circumference and you've got the circle and the bilge size that we refer to, and it's the angles of the individual staves have to be um, very precise in order to, to fit that circumference we're going for. Right. So he's, he's putting it kind of, kind of um, or he or she is look, looking at it, trying to, trying to piece them all together. They piece them, they piece them together, but it's not necessarily a barrel at that point. You kind of have almost like a, a faux ring at the bottom that sort yeah. of puts them together. So then we, what's the next step after so we're, that? So what, it looks sort of like an open flower at that point. So it's like a blue and onion. Yeah. It's, a, it's bloomed open, mm. an open flower, an open onion. And then from that point, we introduce the uh, we introduce some heat and steam back into the wood because now it needs to be a little bit pliable because we're going to shape it into that curved barrel shape that you're used to seeing when you see a barrel. So we introduce the steam and heat uh, back into that barrel, and then we have a machine called a windlass that then squeezes the top of that barrel back together. And at that point, those staves have a curve to them, and it starts to look like a barrel at that point. I, I'm just amazed by how quick the process goes through because I've seen, you know, craftsmen, woodworkers, and they're like, yeah, to make this wood bend, like we have to soak it for like at least three weeks in water, and then we have to bend it, and we gotta, we have to get, um, you know, like uh, clamps to make sure it doesn't move. But you guys are, you guys are making I'm, from, let's say, from the beginning of a run when something's first getting plain to the end of the barrel actually being out there. If you were to, if you were to say like we could do this in the fastest time, what would it be? Yeah, that's a, that's always a tricky one to answer. I get that one a lot, and it's it's because we make our material in sections. We walk through the different departments: our heading department, our stave department, our barrel raising department, and then we've got our windlass and different machines. It it doesn't flow straight from one yeah. end to the other, but you know it it probably you know we could take a barrel half an hour to get through the process. Right. Okay. So it it goes through its steam. We put the rings on. What's next after the rings? Because now we're we're getting into like almost the fun part, right? We're we're seeing some we're seeing some fire seeing some happen, fire. right? So before that, we toast it. Uh, we've got it. We've got the temporary rings on, and then we put it through the windless machine that shapes it. And now it goes through our toasting um, room, we call it. And so the toasting room, you didn't get to see because it it's proprietary. We're pretty proud of that, even though we can't show it off. It's uh, designed in house, and it's a radiant heat that starts to. Uh, caramelize the sugars in the wood and gives it a, a, a nice toast. It's like toasting a marshmallow. If you, if you radiate that, get that radiation from the heat over a campfire, you get that nice golden brown. Well, that's what we're doing to the wood. We're caramelizing those sugars and changing the composition of those sugars. And then from that point, uh, we, we 
send the barrel through a machine called the Buffaloes. Why? The machines were made in Buffalo, New York, <laughs> 80 years ago. Yeah. They're old, the big cast iron machines, which a lot of our equipment is. And so that rolls out and smooths the barrel and helps to shape it. Again, a line in those side joints that we call um, the sides of the stave, so it's nice, tight fit. And we t- that machine also tightens that barrel up good and tight before it goes to the char fire, which is the big grand finale that everybody loves to see because it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. So the char fire is then literally catching the inside of that barrel on fire and then we'll let it burn as long as we choose to for whatever specifications we're going for and we'll let it burn and then we'll quench it let's spritz some water in it and then puts out the fire and down the process it goes now, so what's next after that because I, what were you about to say well as, you know when we were looking at the toasted versus the charred and kenny asked why would you toast it if you're going to char it anyways and we kind of saw the depth of the whiskey moving in and out of the barrel, I guess talk about why you do toast it before yeah, charring it. And that's that's a great question because it's something that we take a lot of pride in is our ability to toast how we toast. And we like to, to set that toast deep into the wood. And what that allows the whiskey to do is have a lot of interaction as that whiskey sets in the warehouse. It's literally, and you guys saw that used stave that you could see the soak line, that whiskey is literally going in and out of that wood as the temperatures change and, and pressures inside that barrel changes. And that's also why you get different, um, different results from different levels and locations in those rick houses and those barrel houses is because you're getting more drastic temperature changes up high. It's getting hotter on a day like today. I mean, it's got to be hot in some of those upper floors of those warehouses on a day like today and you know in july and to where it's going to cool down tonight and that whiskey is going in and out of that wood and it's cycling in and out of that wood more pulling more flavor out and and changing uh, the color and the flavor of the whiskey in there yeah i'm not sure the how deep or to the depth of each stave is but it looked like it was almost 60 or 70 percent you know inside the whiskey yeah yeah it'll, it'll soak some t- that and stave's about yeah, an inch. All the way through. And it'll right? soak almost all the way through, but it's going at least halfway through that stave at, at some point in its life, uh, probably multiple times in its, its life in the warehouse. So it's going halfway through, and we, we kind of touched on this when we were doing the tour. Well, why wouldn't you – you could make almost two times more barrels if you split the size of the wood that you're making the stave out, stave out of in half, and, and why wouldn't you do that? So the thickness of the stave is – we don't want that whiskey to come all the way out through that wood and leak out because anything that, you know, you refer to it as the angel share, any of the angel share, whether it's evaporation or just a pure leak in the barrel, it's not going in a bottle. And that's not why we're going through all this effort yeah. to make this whiskey. Is to, they get their, their shares already. So. Yeah, they're going to get their share. There's just That's part of the process. So we don't, we don't want them to have more than their fair share, as we say. Right. So if that stave is any less than – any less thick than what we make it, then then there's going to be too much loss in that barrel. Right. So uh, after you char it, then what? Because there has to be a, a quality control process, right? Yeah. So we char it, and then it goes, and we put the groove in it that right after the char fire, that then the heads go in that groove, and that's what the, the heads sit, and it's called a crows. So the crows, crozier, the machine that puts the crows, the groove, and the angle in the top of the barrel that you can see, um, then the head is inserted and then tightened. And from there, it makes its way over to what we call our hoopers, where they drive the the final hoops, the iron hoops down on the barrel. And you've got a quarter hoop, a bilge hoop, and a head hoop on each end of the both ends of the barrel. And so we drive those hoops on. And from there, we we put the bunghole in it. And then we pressurize each barrel. Every single barrel we make gets pressurized with air and water. And what that does is lets us detect leaks. So if we pressurize the barrel with air and water and we see bubbles or water coming out of a joint or a hole or some defect in the wood, we every barrel that we make gets ran through an inspection. And so we have an inspector that inspects and then makes a repair to that barrel that's shown a, a defect or a leak. Because again, there's no point in putting all this effort into making a barrel that's not gonna hold, hold whiskey. So we make sure we repair every barrel. Any major defects we send to what we call our coopers, um, our more seasoned uh, you see a lot of 30 40 year employees in, working in the coopering area where the what we refer to as the coopers will change out an entire head if need be or they can replace an entire stave without that barrel falling apart and do any major repairs to the barrels and then they'll check them again for leaks and send them send them on down the line and from there they pretty much are are on a truck heading to a distillery to get filled with whiskey 
There was one thing that we saw that was pretty interesting, and you kind of showed us that you also do these kind of like almost, I don't want to say a cross cut, but you said it was something where like a blade goes through and kind of chops it up a little bit for surface yeah. area. Kind so of talk about that. We have some, we, what we consider some competitive advantages over others by owning our own cooperage. Um, we can do things, what you're referring to is, uh, we call them grooves barrels. So we can, we set grooves or, or route grooves in the barrels. And we can use those in certain products and, and sort of another ingredient that we have that we can, we can put into our portfolio. And it, again, we can have some control over what our whiskey looks like and tastes like. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it, you said this quality control person. Is it just one person there, like, looking for bubbles? And, and how much time would they really spend looking to make sure that a barrel's not leaking? Like, what other kind of uh, safeguards or fail-safes do you really have there to make sure that something's not going to leave the warehouse and be like, oh, crap, send it back. <laughs> Our bad guys. Yeah, right? it's that, that air and water pressure. If you've ever uh, – I, I think of it like this. If you've ever taken some soapy water and sprayed on a tire yep. <laughs> that may have a leak in it, and it'll, you'll see those little bubbles, well – we're not spraying soapy water on the barrel, but we are pressurizing it from the inside out. And you'll see little bubbles, air bubbles start to come through. And that's a pretty good indication of if that barrel is going to leak or not. And so we'll, we make sure we, we make 2,600 barrels a day here and we touch every one of them and they, they're set up where they can spin that barrel around and look for those air bubbles or water leaks so it, we can repair it. And that's, that's pretty pretty good indication of whether that barrel is going to leak or not is that inspection process and pressurization we put it through and i'm sure that uh, moisture plays a huge role in that and leaking and you said at the very beginning you you do uh dry age and then you even dry it more and then you got kilns but kind of talk a little bit more in depth about um, how moisture would affect the process and like what you do to overcome that yeah so we we want the moisture to be where we want it i guess when we introduce it into the process but then that's so we can machine the wood early on. Um, anybody that's in the woodworking industry knows that you're not going to shave or cut or machine wet wood very well. It's going to tear, and it's not going to do what you want. So we have to dry it so we can machine it. And then we're unique that we introduce moisture back into it so then we can then shape it. And then we are unique for the woodworking industry as well. The, the cooperage industry, we're going to fill our barrel with a liquid. Where a furniture maker, they're concerned about their table or their chair or their their dresser is going to dry out and crack. We're not so concerned with that because we're going to fill it with a liquid and let it soak for four to seven years. And so that's, that's the old timers will tell you that the best cooper on earth is liquid or water because that wood's <laughs> going to start to swell. So if there's some minor leak or it's maybe starting to get a little moist around a joint, that wood's going to swell up as it sits in the warehouse and, and it's going to seal itself. Okay, so it's like its own personal built-in Band-Aid, if you will. It right? is, <laughs> literally. Oh, so during the quality control process, how many average number of barrels would you say are ever like discarded right because it sounds like you've got two 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 fail stops there you've got one that's like okay we can do a minor repair and then like if it's a major repair it goes to the cooper so it sounds like you have very minimal waste whatsoever it's, it's very minimal waste um the reason being is we can even if a, a, a barrel would literally fall on back into into individual pieces we can gather that back up and and try it again so we're not going to throw anything in the dumpster and send it to a landfill first of all it's not good business sense because we paid for that wood so we're going to use it and we like to say we were green before green was cool <laughs> if you guys remember you heard a humming noise in the background of a constant hum even when we were back in the tour room where it was kind of quiet uh, that's our our dust collection system and we used our wood shavings that we're shaving to fuel our wood boiler uh, so we then use for our um, steam that we use in the plant and even for heat in the winter we're using that sawdust to fuel our heating system and so we're we're really wasting nothing right so it really is kind of lean right you're, you're yeah. saving money while you're doing it save a little bit of the planet while you're at it and, and we noticed that when we were going through there that it's a very very automated process now so kind of talk about um, is there any process that it doesn't have any sort of machinery involved anymore or is it is it you know and how would they do this before and maybe you can give us a little bit of insight like when these machines were uh, manufactured and put in as part of the process yeah i mean barrels have been around for literally hundreds and hundreds of years and uh, before petroleum before there was containers and bags that we use today everything was in a barrel it wasn't uncommon to go to the hardware store and see a barrel full of nails or or screws or they shipped apples or fruit you know barrels were the only option for a container Probably not that long ago, you know, 120 years ago, barrels were, were the only container available. Um, 
back in the days. No Tupperware back then. No Tupperware. <laughs> I mean, it, slack barrels were for storing things other than liquid, and then tight barrels, which we're making over here at the cooperage, is uh, what they would use for holding any kind of liquid, including whiskey. So as the industry has... Um, subsided the cooperage industry there's not a cooperage in every small town like there was once um the only thing that's keeping cooperages alive is the whiskey industry and it's it's because it's an ingredient in the whiskey i mean a lot of people may not be familiar with the the whiskey goes in that barrel clear it's it's clear and it gets 100 percent of its color from the barrel and it gets at least 50 percent of the flavor from the barrel as well so most distilleries, I guess, outsource their cooperage, you know, to other companies. What? Why did Brian Foreman decide to do it in-house, and what kind of advantages, other than supply, I guess, does it give you all? Yeah, so, you know, we can we control our supply, and it's also an advantage to where it's not uncommon for a master distiller like Chris Morris to come out, and we can play with the toast levels or the char levels, and, and we can try new things. Um, you know, our double-oaked Woodford is a perfect example of, of being able to control the 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 process in-house to where we can experiment it's not uncommon for our brown foreman's research research and development department who we work very close with out here at the cooperage to come out and and we'll try different things because we can and why not you know a lot of a lot of uh good products have come out of trial and error how often i mean how hard is it to tweak something like that right to be like okay we need uh this certain level chart can't be this and you gotta be there'll be like oh, michael go back to the computers and punch <laughs> in number two this time or like how often yeah. I mean, how hard is it to tweak some of that process for for us for the toasting and char it's it's really not too hard we, and that's we've set it up that way on purpose to where we can we can change char levels um, by how long we let the wood burn and you know that's how you're getting your char is fire and that's you know not technology hasn't taken over that aspect yet you know it's if you've got fire and you've got wood, you can you can you can char. Uh, toasting, you can you can toast as well, but we've got our proprietary method to where we're fairly automated and, and we can really control it. And be and the other thing we can be, which which we're we're happy to that we can is we can be very consistent. We can have you know if we want a certain toast level, we can get very close to that same toast level all barrels that we make you know 2600 a day can be very consistent to where if, if we're trying to toast with a little campfire over an open flame it's a little harder to control that temperature and that toast so this i'm gonna ask a question it may be a, a dumb question on my part but is 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 char level like an, an industry standard because you know you can see some brands and they're pretty open they're like oh this is char number four or something like that like is that like an industry standard or you guys just be like no like we just do, do what we do we just do like well, 45 it, seconds and like that's what we we call it's our both. thing um you know a number four char that can be a pretty typical you know run-of-the-mill char but uh you know the double oak back to the double oak that's a that's a different char that's its own specific char level and it, it's got a drastically different toast level uh for the second round of barrels that we put that double oak through so it's it's um it's it's both you know we where we don't really go i, I would say by what the industry if the industry's doing what we think is best we've got no problem going on doing the same things as everybody else but when we can go off on our own and and have something maybe a little different and and change things and control things better we'll go off and do that as well so talk about a little bit more about uh the process of wood in general i know you kind of gave us a little insider secret but you know when i was trying to come up questions with this i was thinking like well it has to be the just the rate of inflation and the way things work i mean is is it getting more costly every single year to to produce barrels just because wood might be at an all-time shortage or anything like that yeah we don't we don't get to hide from anything that the rest of the world you know inflation's going up the cost of goods are going up the cost of everything continues to rise so the cost of a barrel continues to rise and and you know that's that's where scale helps having the size of facility we do making 2600 barrels a day we can we can we can have use scale to our advantage, but we're also every day looking for a more efficient way to do it, we're looking for a better way to do it. We're you know uh, out here at four thirty the other morning asking some of our employees in a in a in a safety meeting, okay, how can what are your ideas? How can we make this more efficient? What can we do? You know, I'm I'm always under the the theory or the the uh, the thought process that the person doing the job knows it better than anybody else on earth. If you're standing at a machine or, or making something for 10, 12 hours a day, who else knows 
that process better. Not me. You know, it's that person that that's doing the work. So we got you know, all these suits coming here telling us what to do, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, we've all thought it and we, you know, we've all suffered that and we've all been there in the manufacturing industry. So I, how can we how can we leverage the diverse workforce that we have at the Cooperage and and we've got a diverse workforce in every aspect of the word and we love it you know we got young we've got old we've got different nationalities and genders and races and and we always are looking for a way to use that to our advantage uh, taking that diverse group of people and and there's there's an advantage in there somewhere and so how can we leverage that to to you know be a little more efficient than the next guy the next the competition so another on that too I was, uh you know with the bourbon boom obviously you all are feeling more more barrels being used how's the oak supply is it getting hit or i mean like it's is there a lot more available or is it you know hard for you to to i guess get the raw materials yeah and that's and that's a great question because that's as i alluded to before that's very near and dear to our hearts because without a sustainable oak source you know i'm looking for a job and so the the supply is there we don't drive the market the housing industry drives the market so we're competing on the open market for for timber and and when when the housing industry is up supplies up when the housing industry goes down supply goes down so we're we're having there's no problems sourcing wood um there's there's money to be made in it for the for the loggers and and the mills so the, so they're producing and 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 we're buying and and it's in our best interest to, to be efficient. You know, we we talk about being green. It's it's a cost thing too. It's cost efficient to you know if we buy a, a stick of wood, we want to use every last piece of fiber in that board that we can. It's just the right thing to do. You Absolutely. said you use somewhere around like one percent of what would be the the net total of white oak that is out there. Or something yeah, in, like the, that. in the in the lumber world and in the, in the wood industry you know we're a very small player in that we don't by any means drive the market and what's available um we're we're just at the mercy of the market right. um, it, you know it, it seems like a lot of barrels and it is but relative to to other woodworking players in in the world we're we're not that big so Peanuts. it's yeah you know, i was gonna say was supply was supply kind of sh- short a little bit in like the 2008 era when uh when the housing market was down or anything like that i think it was but so was you know the de- demand wasn't where it was today either um this this cooperage is is producing more than than it ever has and and that's a good thing you know it's it's a good thing for the economy it's a it's a it's a it's a good thing for the business and it's a, you know it's a good thing for the state it's it's a neat it's a neat to be a part of something that's that's thriving and, and people you know we're sitting here talking about a, <laughs> yeah. a factory you know I, you don't get to experience that in a lot of other industries so it's people have an interest in what we do and that's uh, something we're pretty proud of right it, it's kind of reminds me of that show that it was always on like Discovery Channel it's called like how it's made and you yeah. get to see like how in the factory how everything's put together and stuff so it, it was totally interesting. So last question I'm going to ask you and kind of get your take on it because you're sitting here, you're sporting the badge, you got your shirt on that has Cooper's Craft on it. So what does Cooper's Craft uh, mean to you um, coming that, that it is a new brand coming out and it's, it's named after the Cooperage itself? Yeah, Cooper's Craft is uh, Brown Foreman's newest brand in 20 years since, since Woodford. And so it's pretty cool to be a part of the Cooperage who the brand is honoring. It's honoring the men and women that have been doing this for 70 years. And it's... It's, it's, I'm proud to be part of that, and I haven't been doing this for 30, 40 years like a lot of these employees have, so it's kind of neat to be able to honor them. Um, they, you saw what they do. They're working. Uh, oh, yeah. There's it's, physical labor over there. Work. It's hard. And when it's hot out, it's hot in there. When it's humid out, it's humid in there. When it's cold out, it's cold in the cooperage. And so, you know, they're true American workers. You know, it's, 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 uh, it started with that, and, you know, I think it's appropriate to end with that in Cooper's Craft because it honors the, the workers and the tradition that, that – goes into making a barrel that we've been doing for a long, long time here at the Brown Foreman Cooperage. Oh, awesome. Well, Michael, again, thank you so much for being on the show today. This was fantastic to first cross off a Cooperage on our list, yeah. right? I mean, that was awesome. I think it was uh, it was, was really one of cool. the cooler things we've done. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we've, we've done plenty of our distillery tours, but we don't really get to see the, the beginnings of the process on how everything's made. Yeah, it, it was... I, I'm always blown away when you go to these, you know, big players in the the spirits industry and just the scale and mass of the production and how automated they have everything and and like you said the workers and how many people are impacted by this industry it's really cool so 
Well, awesome. So if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you hear, make sure you support the show. That's Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Yeah, we need gas money to you know, come <laughs> over here to Shavli. Is it Shavli? <laughs> no, this is, this is by the airport. By this, the airport. This is easy. Yeah. We're sandwiched between the airport and Churchill. Churchill, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. And I then, guess, and oh, yeah, we forgot to say people can tour here, right? Yeah, Mint Julep Tours is who they would have to contact to schedule a tour. You know, we don't, we're not open to just come knock on the door and come right come take We're a here. tour but, unless you uh, unless you have your burden pursuit gear with you then you can do whatever you yeah, want unless right? you're a celebrity like you guys and <laughs> carry you, around you gotta, a bunch of mics and you can do a lot right. of stuff but yeah mint julep tours is is who we schedule tours through currently there you go so now cool. you know if you want to come visit come see michael and take a tour of the, the cooperage you know what to do so michael again thank you so much for being on the show uh ryan close us out yeah guys if you have any show suggestions uh feedback comments and Obviously, we'd love your money, too, at Patreon. (laughs) Uh, Just kidding. But uh, we just want to keep this thing going, and we appreciate you all listening, and we'll see you next time.